You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. You had M Wing at the time, which was a bit dark, and a lot of the big characters on there. You had Charlie Bronson. What was Charlie like? I liked him, you know. I shouldn't say that, should I? Because you were in Park House when it was a great escape. Was it free yeah, people? I was. I was on duty that night. Three weeks later, he has another escort to see his grandma. The SO lets him off the cuff, and he's off. And he did a runner and killed himself and I opened the door that morning and uh, he was just there, went in to try and try and help and, and save him but he'd already gone but that's the worst thing I've ever seen the blood was just all over there, everywhere Boom, we're on yeah. And today's guest, we've got Phil Curry, prison officer, nearly 20 years. Pleased to meet you, James. Pleased to meet you, Phil. Yeah, nearly 30 years. I nearly that, 30 years. Nearly 30 years in the prisons. Well, that's a long time, and I know you've spent a lot of time with the so, men who's been on this podcast. It's a life sentence. And, uh, uh, as a life sentence, <laughs> that's what some of the prisoners would say. At least yeah. they're getting out and you'll still be in here. Yeah. I used to say, at least I'm going home at night for my tea. Yeah. Whenever they used to say, well, you're doing a life as well. <laughs> But you've been in guys like Tony Argent, who's been on the show, Yami, Vic Dark. Yeah, yeah lot, lots of the characters you've ever had on here, John Massey, Yami, like I said, Tony Argent. Met loads of characters over the over the years. Eddie Richardson and, yeah, lots of Charlie characters. Charlie Cray. Charlie Cray. How is it when uh, you see men you've been in with who've done lifers, who've, some of them have served nearly 40 years, to be then sitting on podcasts and telling their story and people are kind of engrossed in it and kind of showing them love? To be honest, you know, it, it's quite refreshing to see them out. I mean, I'm still in touch with a few prisoners that have done 18, 20 years and go <laughs> out, and we still have a chat. Um, nice to hear I'm, I'm getting on with, with life outside. I mean, people like Vic Dark, when I was at Parkhurst, he, he didn't really talk to uniform staff, but I joined the job in 91 as a as a prison officer, because you have to do your your 12 month probationary period. But when I first joined the job, I joined the job to be a PEI. I didn't want to wear black and white, I wanted to wear a tracksuit. So that was my 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 calling really, if you like. Mm -hmm. And I, just by chance, I landed in my dream job, job that I absolutely loved, every minute of it. That's good, man. Like, every minute before we get into all the nitty gritty, I always go back to the start of my guests, get a bit of understanding about you, Phil, where yeah. you grew up and how it all began. Yeah. I grew up in Manchester, Greater Manchester, near near Bury, um, on a council estate. Mum and Dad brought up and they split up when I was about 11. But on the council estate, like most council estates, people didn't have a lot of money. Um, none of my friends really had money. Some of my friends and people I associated with was disappearing to ball stools and so I, I'm I'm among that lot that are disappearing. One of my good friends from school was convicted of a murder charge. He went to prison. But I was just into sport really. I just loved playing football. I went out when it was light and came back when the street lights came on. Just played football all day or ran and made bogeys as you did in those days, going round the round the block. How was family life, mum and dad, like good parents? Were they in like police officers or prison system themselves? No, my dad worked in the mills, so he worked in the cotton mill. And my mum worked part-time in a bakery. I'd say I had a, a good upbringing, although we didn't have a lot of money. For instance, my mum, when we were younger, whenever we went to uh, fish for new shoes, it wasn't like going to Clark's or anything in those days. We'd go to Berry Market and there was a shoe store with shoes piled up high. So we'd turn up there and they had a bit of cardboard on the floor. So we'd turn up and all the all the shoes on the pile would all be tied together with a piece of string. So you'd get there, we'd rock up, three of us, my brother, my sister, Julie. We'd, we'd rock up, she'd get us at the side, get a pair of shoes, try them on. Yeah, they'll, they'll do. So they'd have those on, they'd go then. And I'd, I'd go for mine and I'd be looking, trying to, find some shoes I'll be able to play football in in the schoolyard so I'll be trying them on 
And then thinking, no, no, but then as the bloke would be coming over, because they're quite busy, the bloke could be coming over and my mum said, they'll, they'll have to do. So we'd wander off, we'd leave our old shoes on the stall, we'd wander around the corner, my mum would produce a pair of scissors, cut the string and off we'd go with our new shoes. The last ones I got that I could remember, like platform shoes, all multicoloured. Took me about six months to keep my way out of them with hating them. Mm. But it's just, yeah, so we didn't have a, a lot of money, but we had a real happy home life, really, until, I'd say until my parents split up. I stayed with my dad and my brother and sister went with my mum. How was that, the divide in the family? It was hard. I, I would have preferred, really, to have gone with my mum. Why? Um... Just would have had a better, my, my dad worked 12 hour shifts. So he'd start at six at night, six in the morning. So from the age of 11, really, I'm cooking my own, learning to iron and to bring myself up really, cause he'd come home from work and go to bed. So I'd get myself ready for school, walk two miles to school with a friend. So I just thought it would have been better really to have been with my mum, but the problem, the, when my brother and sister go in there with them, I just felt bad if I left my dad on his own, even though it was his fault, really, for, for them splitting up with his womanising. What was your first ever job? My first job was working in a lampshade factory. And I left school and um, I was just looking for a job. I left school at 15, didn't really have any real qualifications, few GCSEs. To be honest, I went through school, loving school, but only really for the sport. I mean, they didn't do GCSE or A-level PE in those days. So I missed that boat. It's because that would have been my my thing, really. So I applied for this job on a YTS scheme. I don't know if you remember those. Mm -hmm. The youth training schemes, £23 a week. Got a job working in this Lampshade factory in the warehouse. So it was a, a factory full of women and a handful of men. So if, it, if nothing else, it taught me how to communicate with women. They'd all be flirting and I'd be going bright red, being a ginger kid. And uh, I'd go bright red and they'd, they'd be like just making me blush all the time. So it was a good grounding in that way, being able to communicate with women and having a, a bit of banter with women. So how do you go from making lampshades to then in the prison system working in a cat, cat A prison? From there, I went to work with my dad in the mill in like a cotton mill and I did a couple of years in the cotton mill didn't mind it I never really wanted to work there uh, I got married very young I met a, a lady on holiday went to Burnley had a couple of children uh, two two girls Emma and Sherry split up when we was over there I was still working in the mills working in a weaving shed in Burnley at that time then called Perseverance and you need Perseverance to work there it was a weaving shed and making um, parachutes. I wouldn't have wanted to jump out of a plane with anything that I wore, I'll tell you that. I wouldn't have jumped off a curb. So that wasn't the job for me. My mate got me a job in Manchester, uh, a garage, delivering cars all over the country. And I still just wanted to do sport. I always grew up wanting to be a footballer. I played semi-pro, but didn't didn't get, get the break to make a professional career might get paid 50, 50 quid for a few games or paid here and there but it was never enough to earn a living so I went in a job centre one day and there was a booklet on the side a pamphlet on the prison service this was in 1989 now. so I goes in the job centre I have a quick read through it and I thought I don't want to do that my mates who had been to prison were saying about the screws and I thought, that's not for me. And I had a flick through it. I got to the end of the booklet and there was a passage, on a, a paragraph on being a PEI or being a dog handler in the service, specialising. So I thought, oh, PEI, fancy that, working in the gym. So I read a little bit more about it, went up to the desk and I said, how do I apply for this PEI? And she laughed and she said, well, you can't just apply to be a PEI in the prison. You have to be a prison officer first and then specialise as a PEI. I said, all right, get me an application form. So I got an application form, filled it in, and then uh, got an interview. I did an aptitude test, uh, got through the aptitude test, and then had an interview. It was a three-panel. So there was two men and a lady who interviewed me. 
And again, towards the end of the interview, I thought it was going quite well. And I still had a shave dead then. I had a shave dead from the age of 15, trying to hide the fact that I'm ginger. <laughs> so you get a little bit less abuse. So anyway, I walked in with my shaved head, and then towards the end of the interview, she said to me, um, why have you got a shaved head? I just said, it's just my choice, really. It's just what I like. And she goes, well, don't you think it'd be intimidating being in a prison and working with prisoners and you on the shaved head? I said, well, to be honest, no, I don't. I said, there are these people are in prison. I said, I don't think they're going to be intimidated by somebody's haircut. And uh, she looked very serious, and at the end of it, I got a letter in two weeks' time saying, you haven't got in. And then there was more bad news saying, you have to wait two years to reapply. So I waited the two years. I was doing the driving job, which I quite liked. The two years flew by. I got a few books out of the library on interview techniques. So when I got that question or that type of question next time, I was ready for the, with the answer. What was your answer? Next time, when they, they didn't give me the exact same one, the next time it was because it was quite a big lad for me age, always trained, always weight trained, and they said about my physical attributes and saying you could come across as intimidating. So it weren't the head now, it was more the physique. And I then just said, well, to be honest, I said I am, I'm, I'm, I like to be healthy. Maybe I could impart that knowledge onto people. My view would be to be a PEI. And that's why I've got myself in shape. So I'm really looking down the line and into the future of what I want to be. And I'd like to be a, more of a role model for the prisoners, really, on how to live a clean life, how to build themselves up, how to look after themselves. So that's, um, so then I got in then. What was it like your first day for when you were getting in there? But you're obviously, like you say, what are you, six three, six four? I was 6'2 six two when, mm -hmm. when I joined the job. So what are you thinking first day in, like, just a young kid like yeah to realize that's what you wanted to do or were you thinking i might have made a mistake yeah I, th I knew i didn't want to be a prison officer and to be honest even now when i look back if i hadn't been a pei i don't know if i would have lasted as an officer i didn't want to be an officer what's the job of a pei you're working in a gym so you're you're supervising but also you're working out with prisoners you show them do programs for some and we also, what some people don't realise, you run a full-time PE course. So you'll get, say, 12 prisoners on a PE course and they'll stay with you for a whole year doing various qualifications like baller leaders, British Weightlifting Association. They do um, badminton leaders, working in the fitness industry. So loads of various courses throughout the year, all learning about anatomy and physiology about how the body works, uh, drug courses. So it's not just about going out and lifting with somebody or writing a programme, it's about education as well. And some of the prisoners that we got, they'd never ever done a course or done any form of education before. So it's quite rewarding that. I didn't know that, obviously, when I was applying for the job, that side of it. I just knew I wanted to keep myself fit and would rather be in a tracksuit all day than a black and white uniform. Because I worked in the, I was in Berlin <coughs> for a bit and uh, I worked in the gym. But the only thing is, we used to get the nonces over in the morning, like, because the gym's probably one of the most dangerous for people getting injured or people attacking. Do you know be. what I mean? With the weights and all the stuff that's there. But yeah. how was it for you when you had to, let's like, see the, the nonces and, to be honest, we had the, the nonces of the Bacons or mm. VPs, vulnerable, vulnerable prisoners, as the staff call them, they're all kept separate. When they come down, I, I always tried not to know what they were in for, but you could never always get away with that because some of them, especially where I work, were very notorious, really. Um, High-profile cases. Um one or two of them that you can look back on and you think, you just see the coldness in their eyes. Completely different type of prisoner than the mainstream prisoners. Not so much you don't get any threats or not violent in, in most ways or most cases. But they're very manipulative on the wing and 
try to be down the gym a little bit as well. So it's a completely different session, really. You don't, we didn't have AP courses with PPs neither, so we didn't do any education with them. It was just come down, supervise. Didn't really work out with, with many. Although I have to be, has to be said that some vulnerable prisoners and the bacons, nonces, whatever term, who come down, not all of them were sex offenders. Some of them um, could be debtors that have run off the wing because they owe money or owe for drugs. Protection. Protection. So they're not all sex offenders. So, and you could generally tell the difference between the two, yeah. just in the demeanour and the way they were. Because you're only there to do your job. Like yeah. Even when I was on a gym pass, like, I loved that job and I wouldn't yeah. do fuck all to jeopardise it. I'm not daft. Yeah. It, was a, it was the best job in the jail. I, I did eventually get kicked off, but it's, I just thought, because they used to come over in the morning, it was just, it was an eerie vibe. It was a horrible vibe. We had to give them their shorts and their T-shirt. Never fucking spoke to them, but, but the, some of the prison officers actually used to tell us what they were in for. Some of the prison officers actually used to want us to batter them. Yeah, yeah. So they I did. I have heard of things like that, and they've obviously never been part of that. Mm. I did a year on the landings at Parkhurst, then went in the gym at Parkhurst. So that'd be 90, 93, 94 when I joined as a, as a PI, I went on my PE course. Because you have to go on a PE course for 26 weeks at the time. Did all the mountaineering, all the various courses. Absolutely loved it. Mm. It was everything that I dreamt of to See, be a PEI. See, when, do you get the heads up at how is a certain, like, wouldn't say there's five stars and you say that this prisoner's like, five stars, he's dangerous. Like, do you get the heads up how dangerous, is there not paperwork you just get to yeah, tell you how you, dangerous they you are? Get, you get an idea when you get a daily briefing sheet as well if somebody's coming who's high profile or, and you get some that will come down, like in the gym, certainly a long line in the late, late years, we had some that would only come down and, we had two gyms, we had a hat and sweet gym and the main gym and one or two that we get high profile cases were only allowed to train on their own. One of them had done, like you said before, in another prison, put a dumbbell over somebody's head. So he, he trained on his own in, a, mm. in, in the other prison, in the other gym. How do you, bef do you, how do you befriend the high profile prisoners? Like, do, is, there a, is there an act to it or do you just be yourself? I've always, always just been myself, always from the start of the job. And to be honest with you, there's, there's a lot of prisoners I'd rather sit down and have a drink with than some of the staff, if I'm honest. I know that might sound absurd, and it might not win me too many friends in the prison and staff-wise, but I think other people would say the same, certainly PEIs. I was just always myself. I, I was very very fit and I don't want to blow smoke up my own ass, but I was very fit. So I used to do circuit classes, uh, join in the classes we'd on, play football. When they did the interwing, I'd be on one of the teams. It, some of the cons on the other, prisoners on the other wings didn't like it. And one of the lads on the A wing that I played for at the time would be saying, oh, you got a screw playing for you on the interwing. And, and they were saying, nah, he's not. And, that brought down barriers playing and because I was all right at football at the time as well, they were saying, well, we'll have him play for us next season then. Mm -hmm. So on the next round, I'll go and play for another wing. So, but yeah, it was just, how you befriend somebody over time, especially the gym orderlies, you see yourself, you was like a gym orderly. You get a, an old special bond, they're down there with you all day, every day. Oh yeah, they might be cleaning, but sometimes you'll you'll have a training session with one. So you get talking, barriers come down, get to find out what they were doing before they came into the prison. Um, for instance, there's one lad, James Gilligan, who I'm still in touch with. Just got out actually last week. So all the best to you, James. Yeah, good luck to him. Gilly is called. But he was a Jim Audley. Uh, did the PE courses. He moved on to Oakwood after, got in touch with me and said, I just want to thank you for everything that you did for us in the time in the prison. Kept in touch. And I know when he was at Oakwood, when he started to go back down the system to Cat B's, C's, D's, he put all his, his knowledge to good use. It was part of introducing the, 
the crossroads system for the kids who've come into the prison and he talked about the drugs and the downfall of coming into prison. So he went on to really do what we, we wanted him to do, to go on to a better life. And now he's out there and free and going on to be a gas fitter. And Good on him. So that's a success story. And there's lots of them. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's about four or five that I still have contact with they've gone on and done all right because mm-hmm. you were in Parkhurst when it was a great escape was it free yeah, people I was. I was on duty that night so what happened then it was one of the, oh. the best prison the, one of the biggest prison breaks in British history is that correct it was it was yeah and because it's a category, a category, category prison. Yeah, and, uh, which are always deemed as nobody can get out of mm-hmm. and this is a bit of an exclusive for you to be honest James everybody talks about this great escape from Parkhurst and the three men Andy Rogers who's a Scottish lad uh, good old Andy, yeah, boy. Good old Andy. I'll tell you what, he's one of the most powerful men I've ever met in prison, Andy. What way? Strength or mind? Strength. Strength-wise. And mind as well, really, because when I look back, he never had it with anybody, really. Everybody was shocked when he escaped with those other two because he was always a bit of a loner. But nobody ever went near He He was powerful. He was the first man I ever saw come through a prison cell door and took it off with his bare hands and still wanted to fight when he came through it. My first meeting, talking to Andy, and I'll come back to the escape in a minute, but my first meeting of Andy, when I first got to Parkhurst, bearing in mind I've been there about three weeks, so I'm now on the line and I'm obviously in black and whites because I'm still a prison officer waiting to do my year so I can apply to be a PEI. I'm still going in early and volunteering to... Uh, referee football and uh, going out in the yard refereeing the football matches with the prisoners because none of the PIs really wanted to do it because it was a real precarious job doing that you used to get a lot of stick but I didn't mind it so I was quite, quite enjoyed, because I'm a footballer I enjoyed it I just, I just enjoyed being part of the game so anyway my first meeting with Andy I was, I was put onto the chips if you're on chips in the, in the prison it's probably, I didn't know this at the time, but I'm cleaning officer and they said, right, first day on the hot plate, you're on chips. So I'm on chips and I'm dishing the chips out. And they're coming along, coming through. And you haven't really got time to be out checking everybody out. So I scoop onto the plate, getting your next scoop ready. And they're moving along the hot plate. So unbeknown to me, Andy's coming through. And uh, I get a scoop of chips, put them onto his plate, get them, get them ready for the next one. And he's still stood there looking at me. And he goes, are you fucking counting them? So I said, I have got time to count them, mate. Move along. And with that, he looked. The whole hot plate just went quiet. The prisoner just froze. And I'm thinking, I think I might have picked the wrong one here. Anyway, he walked out and walked off. Somebody said something to him and outside and he went up on the landing and the officer next to me said you don't know how fucking lucky you are I said what? he said he's notorious for tipping the hot plate up smashing the hot plate he said he does it all the time over food he said I don't know how you got away with it a few years later when he, he became a gym orderly actually and we had a little conversation about it and I said oh do you remember the time and he was laughing and he said yeah I remember I said, how come you didn't tip the hot plate up? You was notorious for it. How come you didn't do it? I said, I said, no, don't get me wrong. I'm glad you didn't. And he said, to be honest, you know, he said, I know you didn't say it in any malice. You were saying it was a bit of a joke. He said, it did piss me off. He said, but he said there was something about you that, that made me think, I, I don't want to wait him. He, 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 he said, some people might say that and they'd be saying it as, with malice and like, just jogging you on. He said, but I knew it wasn't that way. Was he in for murder? Yeah, he was in for murder, Andy, yeah. So, yeah, he was in for murder. so what happened then when they free escape? Was oh. there any incline that anybody was going to escape or is it just out, so out of the ordinary? I think some of the prisoners probably knew because apparently, allegedly, they were trying to go three days before the escape. I wish they had them because I weren't on duty. The night that they went, they were but apparently on the night that they tried, at the back of the gym, they had a little a boxing bag and a little room with a door that went out onto exercise yard. 
Well, unbeknown to us, they'd made a key. Williams, who was one of them who escaped, was a bit, a very intelligent lad, almost a bit sciencey, like you know where you get this nutty professor. A, a strange character. Not many, again, not many other prisoners had anything to do with him. It was just a bit weird, a bit of a weird character. And unbeknown to me as well at the time, otherwise I might have been watching a little bit more carefully. I only found out later when I went to Long Larkin after Parkhurst. When he came en route to, Long, to Parkhurst from Long Larkin, a lad who became my friend later in life, Chris Goddard, another PEI from Long Larkin, he took him hostage en route to Parkhurst with a little syringe, put it to his neck and got off the van. By the time he got off the van, the police coshed him and Anyway, but anyway, he yeah, ended up, he didn't get away, but he ended up at Parkhurst. So he had got previous for trying to escape, but I wasn't aware of that at the time. Mm. So there was him and another lad called Rose, who again I knew from down the gym, was quite quiet. Uh, insignificant, really. You want to put all three together. If you was going to say three people who are going to escape from this prison, that probably a pattern, maybe Andy because of his his power. And I think he was there really for getting through the fence and bending the fence because he had that, that power to, to do that. So anyway, three days before they tried this key that they made, tried to get out of the bank and it wouldn't open the door apparently. This is all that I found out later off different prisoners that confided in me. So anyway, they tried to get out, couldn't get out, abolished it and then tried again on the 3rd of January, I think it was, if memory serves me well. So the 3rd of January, so obviously they were planning on trying to be out for New Year. So the 3rd of Jan, they actually tried the key, they get out, they're gone. And on the night I was on duty, and the, the gym was absolutely rammed with maximum numbers. And a lot of the big hitters were down there as well, like your Vic Darks, like your... Kevin Browns and loads of the, the infamous characters were down there. We used to have a Juliet officer that used to bring the the prisoners over to the gym. So they'd bring them down, count them off the wings, count them into the gym and give the numbers. And then they'd have a box where he would sit, give them the numbers on the phone, and then we'd be doing our thing. One of them, one of the PIs within the sports all that night, which was me, refereeing five aside another one in the weights room supervising or joining in, and then another one just float in between. So at the end of the gym, again, unbeknown to us, uh, those three, Rose, uh, Andy and Williams, were all down the gym. We knew that we would seen them come in the gym, but didn't really know the word about it because we are all, like, I'm, none of them play football, so they weren't in the sports hall with me. So at the end of the session, because the other prisoners are aware of what's going on now, they get all get rammed into that little holding area waiting for movement back to the wings. And because they know what's going on, they're all getting on to the Juliet officer saying, open the fucking door, I want to get back, I've got my food on, go get back to the wing. So they're giving it him. So then with that, he's going and he's trying to count them out. We're sweeping up behind, making sure that the gym's clear. So as far as we're concerned, when we've done the rounds, the gym's clear. The gate's locked as normal. So they all go back to the wing and then a catastrophe of errors, really. As they're going on to the wing, there's normally an officer there meeting them, counts them back on the wing, roll correct, blah, blah, blah. And then we get a second gym. So the second gym are now down and still nobody's aware that three of them have gone. So we now do a second gym for an hour do an hour in the gym, get rid of that class, just as we we're going to get rid of the class, we get this alarm bell going off, uh, alert, and the dog handler had found an hole in the fence. So by then, they'd probably had an hour and a half. Unbeknown to them, if they'd have gone straight for the ferry, they'd been off the island. As it happened, Rose uh, said that he could fly a plane so they went for a little airport on the island called Binstead Airport. 
So I went over to Pinstead Airport, um, tried to start a plane. Later on, when Andy Roger again, I met him years later, I spoke to him about it. And I said, Andy, I said, you know, why, why didn't you just go straight off the Why go for a plane? He said, to be honest, Phil, he said, I wanted to fucking kill him when we tried that plane and he couldn't even get it started. He said, he couldn't even start it, never mind fly it. And anyway, five days later, there was at large for five days. And I lived at a little place, a village called Wooten on the island. And there was actually caught about three miles from my house where they were just trying to wade through water. And their plan then was to try and go and get a boat. But an officer off duty spotted them, notified the police, and that was it. That was the game up. No way, an off duty, off duty. Yeah, yeah. How, how was an officer, yeah, seen them. An off duty officer. See, because you're you're on shift that night, do you then, as this question marks become mm. above the prison officers' heads as if, could they be involved? Did you, do you get asked those questions as well? Yeah, yeah, massive investigation. And repercussions were sent, it sent shockwaves all across the, the whole service. To be honest, uh, Parkhurst really should have been shut down for a while. There are so many, much refurbishment going on. It was just like a building site, really. So in many ways, it was an accident where to happen. But here's the exclusive, really. Two years before those three went, and I never, and you Google it, you do anything, you can never find this. I've never, I've Googled it, I can't see anything about it. But another person escaped, a cat here, off, off the island on, at Parkhurst, a lad called Pewter. I think it was Terry Peter or might have been his brother. But he was in the laundry and whether he got out in the back of the laundry van just before roll check or whether it was a bin wagon because the bin wagon used to come in, empty all the bins and then go back out. And it used to happen before roll was correct. So I think he either got out in the back of the bin wagon or in back in the laundry van and it was just completely kept quiet. Never, never heard anything about it. like the the three that escaped. It's massive. I mean, they created a film about it. But he got off the island. Off the island was, I think, he was lifted in London, probably about two weeks later. But nobody ever, uh, never hear of his name. So, see the three guys that get caught. Where do they go after that? They, 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 they got caught. They did court. I did a couple of uh, court runs actually on this on the case which was held near Belmarsh, at the court near Belmarsh. I did a couple of court hearings there, Rose was in there, and I had to, because I had to be a witness. In the end, they didn't call me to give any evidence, but when I was up in the in the, in the the uh, viewing gallery, I remember Rose saying, I want a word with the judge. And he said, I, I, I object, I don't want him sat up there. When I, and to be honest, I got all right with Rose. And say object, and the judge said, "No, I, I, I turned it because he's not, he's not giving evidence anymore." So I was allowed to sit, just sit there. So I watched the trial unfold. Uh, they went not guilty of all things as well, you know. Why? Just yeah, so, uh, to piss off the system? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I couldn't believe it when they went. I'm glad they did. <laughs> so they've been caught outside their prison. Yeah, yet, yet they're pleading not guilty, yeah. but they're already doing lifers, were they not? Yeah, yeah. So I think they probably thought, well, "So what?" It gets him a few um, extra days out of prison, doesn't it? Yeah, and it got me a few days out as well and some subs, so I wasn't bothered to yeah. do I was quite pleased, but I was shot, but I was quite pleased. How does that change part cost then? Like, oh, well, after that, does it become it, stricter? The use? It changed it, and a lot, to be honest, a lot of the other prisoners weren't happy about the escape because at the time, uh, Parkhurst was the go-to jail. People from all over the country, really, when you talk to Yami, when you talk to Yami and that, they, they, they would pay money if they could to try and get to Parkhurst because it was right. so laid back and liberal. I mean, the, the governor at the time, John Marriott, God rest his soul, he was a very liberal man. He used to wear the red labour tie. Uh, lovely man. I knew him socially as well as a governor. But if, if anything, lovely man, but too nice really to be a governor. He'd come down and have a game of badminton in the gym with high-profile prisoners. Nice guy that way, and had a lot of great 
thoughts and visions about prison, but probably just went a little bit too far. So where the line is, really, I've seen it over the 30 years, I've seen it go too far one way and too far the other way. Very rarely does it sit where it should sit, in the middle. Showing sure off for it, it would not be too nice. Exactly, yeah. There's got to be a line to keep the, the prison safe. If prisoners are just le left to run riot or to do whatever they want, it becomes quite an unsafe place to be. And I think most prisoners don't like it that way either. You might get some, some of the bullies might, might like it. The, the top dogs might like it. But anyone just wanting to get on and do the bird and complete the sentence mm -hmm. wouldn't like it. But at, at the time when John was there, I mean, we had outside Peacock Jim coming in, people with masks and wrestlers coming in. We had outside football teams, which was great. But the security, I would say, for a cat here prison was quite lax, especially with it being a building site as well. But the ramifications of the escape just sent shockwaves. It, it, they, there was a Leamont inquiry after the escape and that just changed the whole prison service. The line started to move back. Uh, I don't think Long Latin was ever the same jail as it was then. It came out, it was almost immediately removed from the Cate system. Uh, to be honest, I preferred it when it was Cate, even though it was probably a bit too far. You had M Wing at the time, which was a bit dark, and a lot of the big characters on there. You had Charlie Bronson. What was Charlie like? I liked him, you know. I shouldn't say that, should I? But nah, quite. If you like them, you like something. Yeah, but most people, most people outside would say, "How do you like Charlie Bronson?" But I think I, the majority of people who come into his his life speak highly of him. Yeah, you know what? I, I didn't have massive dealings with him, but the dealings I had, I found him a character, found him important. And because we had that same, you know, the love for training, really, because he did, he just loved training. And anybody that trained had a common goal with him. So I got on, I got on quite well with him. I talked to him about his artwork and bits and bobs. Never had a long period with him because he never really had... The longest I had with Charlie was when I first went there and I was in the gym for the first few months before he actually got stabbed on the yard there. Uh, I was actually on the yard the day he got stabbed. What was that uh, like? Sad, really, you know. I was shocked that it happened as well. Although I think, looking back, I think it probably happened because at the time we had... Uh, the Arifs, I don't know if you've heard the Arifs, the Turkish family, they was the, the ones mainly running the prison. So they were the, the top dogs, certainly on B-Wing, the big wing. And they had Bill the Bomb at the time, I don't know if you remember Bill the Bomb. No. Bill the Bomb, should mention him really, because he's the most intimidating, fearsome man I ever met. But again, I quite liked him. Before I go back to Charlie, I'll say about Bill the Bomb. Bill used to be very volatile. He'd have a drink and a bit of drugs, always on the on the look for drugs. But he'd been in the ring with some real big fighters. He'd been in the ring with Muhammad Ali. Um, only sparring, but because he could take a punch and give a punch, he was a he was a, a real handy. Probably the probably the hardest man I've ever met in prison. Everybody feared him, but. Unlike Charlie, Bill liked to have a bit of a boss, really, and I think the Aris were a little bit of his boss. And he liked to work under that. So while they got an element of control with Bill, all the rest in peace as well, Bill, but they have an element of control with Bill. With Charlie, he didn't have that element of control. I think it was a... Bill could be a loose cannon... But they, they had that control with him, whereas Charlie, I don't think anybody really controlled him. He was his own man that way. So I think with that, and I don't know the ins and outs of why he got stabbed, but it was certainly wasn't just to do with the lad who stabbed him. Again, he was dead now as well. He mm -hmm. sadly passed away years later. How straining is it on your life? See, like, I've had prison officers on, and a lot of them struggle with PTSD because 
it's like police officers and that as well that like people can say what they want about them but the shit that they have to see the suicides the stabbings the shootings yeah. the, the abuse like how hard is it on your own mind to when you go home with that can you block it off and shut off when you go home I think I must have done because I, I, I saw a little bit of is it Sam Sam who, who had to interview Sam Sam's worth yeah. yeah he's a funny I, a lot of time for Sam I, I saw a bit of his interview with you and I worked from completely different angles really mm -hmm. and that's why I contacted you because my my perspective is completely different to his my perspective is I had 30 years and for probably 29 of them I just had fun never uh, I, I saw suicides and when I was in black and white for that first year saw people kill themselves and hanging and 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 it did it did bother you, but to be honest, the the good experiences in prison for me far outweighed any bad. Far outweighed it. But that's a good thing then. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that's because the way you see the world though? I think partly and partly because I'm not in black and white. I spent most of my career, twenty seven year of it, in in the uh, tracksuit. So you're not a uniform, they don't see it. I've done an escort before with somebody, a prisoner, years ago. And I'd get on the escort, because when I did an escort as overtime, I'd have to put black and whites on. And I'd get on the escort, go and pick him up, and take him over, and he goes, fucking hell, fella, I didn't realise you was a screw. And that's how, how it was, you know. And I had that a couple of times. I said, yeah, of course, what do you think I was? He said, I just thought you was a personal PI. trainer. He said, I thought you were PIs, but... He said, stupidly, he said, but I never thought of you as a screw. Mm -hmm. And I've had loads of my prisoners say, you know, I don't, I don't see you as a screw, really. Just on an, in another life, we'd have been friends. What's it like taking prisoners to funerals? Oh, God. Is that hard work? It's funny you should say this, you know. I, um, I did about three funerals. The first funeral that I did... Bearing in mind the first escort that I ever did on at Long Martin when I was in black and white, this is the first experience of taking somebody outside the walls. We had to go to a council estate in Brighton and this council estate was rough, a bit like where I was brought up, to be honest. So we take him there and I had a word with him before and said, look, you know, you've got to stay on the cuff. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. And the SO at the time, I've gone all right with him but I didn't know him that, that well. He didn't come down the gym or anything. So he was off a different wing when I saw my wing. So he gets there and we're visiting his dying grandma. So his grandma's there and we go in. There's lots of people coming in and out, his friends, and they're starting to put a bit of pressure on saying, let him off the cough. It's his grandma, you should let him off the fucking cough. What are you doing? So the SO said, look, I'm cuffed to him. I said, I'm not coming off the cough. And he said, I think we should, you know, let him have five minutes. I said, no, I'm, I'm not coming off the cuff. I just had a bad feeling about it. I didn't trust him. Didn't have really a good rapport with him. And he was a bit of a screw up. Anyway, on the way back to the prison after the visit, he kept asking to go and visit his sister. I said, no, we're, we're going back. We got back. Three weeks later, he has another escort to see his grandma. The SO lets him off the cuff. And he's off. And he did a runner. And I just thought then, so bearing in mind that that was my first and only real experience at Parkhurst, I land up Long Martin. I've done a few years now. And I train with this lad called Pedro, notorious prisoner and from a notorious area of Birmingham called Hansworth. Really rough area. Where the prison is, really. And I don't know whether you know, even some of the prison officers at Birmingham have been shot at coming out of the gate there. So it's a notorious area. But Pedro I really got on with, had a rapport with him, trained with him, and his training partner, Felix Fraser, they called him. So I got on with him and had a rapport. They came down the gym one day and um, Fraser always trained with uh, Pedro. So I said to him, where's Pedro this morning? And he said, ah, oh, he's not down. He said, his son's been shot. I said, oh. And he said, um, he said, so his head's in bits. Like he's, he's applied to go to a funeral. 
and they won't let him go. So I said, no. I said, who's he applying to? He said, security, number one, they've knocked him back. He said, because it'll be in Answorth, which is a rough area. So I said, I'll see what I can do for him. I said, I don't know whether it'll work, but I'll go and have a word with security. I knew the governor in security quite well. Rob Lux, what he was called. So I went down, I said, Rob, I said, Pedro. I said, I train with him regular. I said, I think I know him well enough to be all right. I volunteered to take him on the escort to the funeral. And he said, look, Phil, he said, we, we tried, we, we spoke to the police. They're not prepared to man it. He said, they're not, they don't want to go anywhere near it. And I said, well, that's a good thing, isn't it? And he went, you having a laugh? I said, well, no, I said, because I'd rather take him and not have the police around. I said, because I'll just antagonise the situation. I said, we should keep it low profile. I know a PEI will come with me. I've spoke to him. He'll volunteer to do it with me. And he said, right, he said, if you get an SO that will volunteer for it, I'll let you do it. But it's your, on your head be it. He said, if it, if it goes wrong, it's your job. So I said, all right then. So he like, looked at me, thinking that I'd back out. So the next day I saw Pedro, I said, look, I've gone out of word, Pedro. They're going to let you go, I think. And he went, well, I've been told not. I said, well, I've volunteered to do it with you. I said, I'll get on with you. I said, as long as you give me your word that, you know, I said, I know where it's at. In Armsworth, it's going to be rough, it's going to be... And I said, to be quite frank, I'm probably going to be the only white man there. And he said, he said, all right. He said, you know, you'll not get any problem from me, Phil. He said, I just respect that you've done that for me. And I'll go to the funeral. So anyway, I got clearance on the morning of the funeral, went to get him. Me and my, my pal, uh, Ralph Taylor, had a word. He said, I'll volunteer to do, because we had to go to the chapel of rest as well. He said, I'll volunteer to be on the cuff in the chapel of rest and you do the rest of the funeral. So I said, OK. So he goes to the chapel of rest and Pedro's a, a, a tough man, really. So anyway, before that, we're coming out of the reception. We, the van pulls out of the prison. I'm talking to Pedro, saying, I oh, know it's going to be a tough day. I know it's going to be hard. I'll, I'll be cuffed to you. Explain them what will be going on throughout the day. I'll be cuffed to him at the funeral when he's going to the ground in the service. He said, that's fine, Phil. He said, for today, Phil. He said, anyway, I think of you as a mate anyway. He said, but for today, he said, I'll just introduce you as Phil, my mate. So I said, that's fine, man. He said, just do whatever you've got to do. I said, all I ask is you just respect what I've done for you and you come back with us at the end of the day. And I said, also, we've been told we can't take you to the wake. He said, that's fine. He said, I don't want to go to the wake anyway. So I said, OK. So we're pulling out of the prison and, he, and all of a sudden I hear him go, for fuck's sake. So Pedro, are you all right? He goes, Phil, he said, um, and he was agitated. He said, I've left, he said, I've made something for my lad that will go in the coffin and in the ground. He said, I've fucking left it in reception. And the asshole said, we can't go, can't go back for it. And I said, I said, this could make or break the day, really. I said, Pedro, I'm going to see if I can go back. So the van stayed there. I got him to go on the radio, the driver, and said, look, I'm coming back in. I'm going to reception. And I picked up the little thing that he'd made, like a little cross with the uh, wove some fabric around, quite a pretty little thing. So I brought it back. I said, Pedro, I've got it. I'll give it to you when we let you out after and when we get there. OK. So we get so I give him the, the cross and everything. We get to Chapel of Rest. Ralph's cuffed to him, goes into the Chapel of Rest. And I just hear him break down. And it was all, all awful to hear him just breaking down in there. And I'm thinking as well of Ralph being in that situation with him, because you're cuffed to him, you don't, you don't know his son, but you have to watch him break down like that. So he came out, we swapped over on the cuffs, and I went on the cuffs and said, you OK, Pedro? And he said, yeah. We went to Armsworth uh, for the funeral. They had a big steel band playing. They had a horse-drawn carriage, massive funeral. But all of Armsworth just stopped 
uh, mainly black community. I don't think not that it matters, but I, I think I was we was the only three white lads there in the in the church or anywhere to be seen. We goes in for the service and I'm cuffed to him. A few people came over and true to his word, whenever he came over he all said, This is Phil and introduced me just like I was there as part of the family really. So to be honest it was quite humbling the way he did it. So we had that, we comes out and then unbeknown to me we go over and it's part of the culture that they dig some of the soil and put some of the soil in and the steel band they're playing. So we go over there and said, Phil, he said, I'm, I'm supposed to like, put the soil in. So I said, as long as you don't mind me doing it with you, we'll do it. So I went over and we both puffed together, put the, some soil in together. I gave him a, th a th I said, are you all right? He said, yeah. A few of the big gangsters, local gangsters came over and said, Gov, he's coming to the wake. I said, no, I said, we can't go to the wake, man. And Pedro just stopped it there and he said, look, he's, he's the reason that I'm here. We're not going to no wake. Don't ask again and make sure nobody else asks. With that, it all went smooth and we goes back. Um, I got called to the governor's office a few days later, given a £50 voucher for what we did. And uh, probably about two years later was the next time I heard of Pedro and I got a long letter off him just thanking me for everything I did. How hard does that when you see some prisoners not able to get to see their mum or their, their, their kids? Actually, we can understand as well, especially if they're high profile, they're yeah. used to a track of paper, they've done some terrible things. That, yeah, as much as you can be friend for us, I've got family and friends still in prison. I'm good friends with murderers, bank robbers. Fucking, it's not that they're good, they're, they're good people, but again, they've still got that mind as if, yeah, were you nervous that whole day? Yeah, I was on, I was on center hooks, and certainly the SO was. What made you trust them so much? Just the. the the relationship that we built up, especially if especially if you've had an escape here, if you know, and you are working at the Great Escape, people will start to think it's fucking full working with I the coins. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but he wasn't the only one as well. I did that three times while I was there, and got a letter off all of them, and they all came back. Never had a, never once had a problem. I always got one of my colleagues because we'd get on with them to go with me. And the other one that I did with him, exactly the same thing, quite a harrowing experience to his mother's funeral. Mm -hmm. But again, ended the same way, just come back, no problems at all. Because I had no Razor Smith on, his son passed away and he never got let out. But that changed him to yeah. be a better person as well because he started making changes in his life. How hard that is for a prisoner that they end up smashing up the gaff or to just accept it. Like, do you see that a lot in there? The, I've, I've had a few where I volunteered and they didn't get to go as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Lee Russia. Who's that? He was quite a high, high profile, high risk prisoner. He was part of the the biggest heist in in London. You know, when they got away and I think there's still 30 odd million pounds missing of it. Mm. Is that Lee Murray so, in that involved? Lee Murray? I think, I think it was, yeah, with Lee Murray. The and cash? And Jet Book Papa. 56 million. Yeah, yeah, they had the band there, didn't they? They couldn't get it all in. Yeah, they had there to leave more, some of the cash. There was more money than they expected mm. to be there, yeah. Yeah. Well, I got on really well with Lee, trained with him, and his Cody, Jet Book Papa. You know, I've, I've heard from Jet since he got out as well. He got out not long ago. He sent me a, a wedding photo where he's got married over in Albania. So I heard from him as well, which was nice. But I've gone really well with him. Well, Lee Russia, I volunteered to do a, an escort when one of his family died. I spoke to him, but they, they wouldn't let him go. He appreciated that I tried and did my bit, but he didn't kick off or, or anything. Sean Riley, another one that I did, I volunteered, and they wouldn't let him go. But again, I pushed as far as I could to try and get to do it. A change of number one governor sometimes they're prepared to take a little bit of a risk and other times they always are on the side of, would of you, caution. Were you ever attacked or anything for? No, I had, um, in my first six months when I was at Parkhurst, I had a contract boy on me. Why? 
I don't know, you know, there's, there's a lad called Cyrus, and he was quite notorious. Not, he wasn't a big hitter, but he was a bit of a druggie. And I think it was just something or other, like he wanted a blade, uh, a razor. And I said it one for one, so I had to have his razor to give him a razor. He said, well, I haven't got it. And I said, well, I can't give you one. And it was as simple as that. And then, I think it was about three days later, I got a phone call, go to security. And I went down there and said, We'd have in, we've had information from good sources that you've had a contract player on you. I said, all right. And he said who it was, and I said, he said, what's the background? I said, well, the only, the only real, you know, communication I've had with him was when he came to me, I was a cleaning officer, and he came to me and said, can I have a, a blade, a, a razor? It was one for one, and he didn't have one to give me, so I didn't give him it. And he said, it's a bit steep to put a contract out on you. He said, but we've had word that there is a contract put out on you. So with that, I was always worried. He was always giving me the, the eye every time I was on the wing. I was worried where he was. And when he said, well, you had a fright, and that was one time where, because at the time in the 90s, Parker was quite a volatile place with lots of weapons on the wings. And so I was always mindful of where he was, if it was on his landing or I was going down, always worry of where he was or any associates of his. If he was approaching me, I'd always be a bit cautious. What's the worst thing you've seen in prison? Probably an Irish lad when I first got there called Boyle who, um, he just caught up and killed himself and I opened the door that morning and uh, he was just there, uh, went in to try and, try and help and, and save him but he'd already gone. But that's the worst thing I've ever seen. The blood was just all over there, everywhere. That's the worst thing I've ever seen. And to be honest, to be honest, it probably helped me that I didn't really know him or have a rapport with him. If that had happened to somebody who, who I'd had a good rapport with, it probably would have affected me more. So I, I suppose I disassociated myself with it a bit easier that way. No, it's still alive, and you still seen that, and it's harrowing to see. But um, but yeah, that was the, probably the worst thing looking back. Do you see a lot of prison officers leaving the job because it's just too much? Now, now there's lots of prison officers leaving. You, years ago, you never got any prison officers leave, really. They were, it was a career, so you join a job and you see people do 25, 30 years. I don't think you'll see that anymore. Because the way they've changed it, the structure of everything, they've cut back on the pensions. It's not so much of a career as been made where you'll get people join the job for three years and leave, a year and leave. You get some that only do three months and leave. You never, never really hear of that. But you've got now, which is quite frightening really, and I wonder where the, the service is going. You've got experienced staff just saying, I've had enough, I'm going to leave. I'm going to get another job, even like jobs working in a supermarket or being cute. I think that was unheard of before, so that's how, how bad it's got, but it's sort of short of staff now, I believe. What was it like? Work, did you ever work on the block? People are dubbed up some 24 hours a day. Just I, did, I did a few things on the block. Uh, one of the things, I don't know if you've ever heard of Ezra Taylor, they call him Danger. No. It was a mad mountain of a man who's about six foot eight, built like a barn door, he's in for murder. And again, I had a good rapport with Ezra, trained with him, got him a couple of extra gym sessions here and there, where I could and where I was allowed. And this is where having a good relationship can save the day as well with a, with a prisoner. So he's down in the block. I, I have worked at the block, but just on odd shifts if I was doing overtime. Never was somewhere where I would volunteer to work because it's not really my type of thing. Like if it was, I went down the block one day and there's again, it's a prison that I had a bit of a rapport with. I'm rubbing him down. So there's two other officers stood at the side of me. I'm rubbing him down. And he just starts engaging in conversation because he knows me, talking about training. And then the officer next to me just says, because he, he like moved and he said move again like that and you fucking will jump all over you and I was like really Why, what, what's the need for that I said it's alright and then after 
we had a conversation about doing a training program for him in the pad because obviously you can't get to the gym when you're in the block. So I did a training program for him. And I went down to the office after and I said, what was that for? They said, he wasn't being aggressive on me. He said, oh, he, he's done it before though. I said, but he wasn't going to do it. He wasn't going to jump on me. And I just thought then that it wouldn't be the job for me. It's not. Some people are, are that type of character. They, they join the job to, and some bullies as well, really. They join the job to do that. That wasn't me. I, I preferred talking to people. But going back to Ezra, who goes down to the block this one day, and again, I'm doing an escort. But I, so I'm in black and white. But I don't know what escort I'm doing, so I get down the block. There's a lad there, Neil Barnes, who works down the block, but he comes to the gym. So I know him, he's an officer. So I said to him, who's it we're taking? And he says, oh, fuck, it's Ezra Taylor, danger. So I said, all right. I said, that's all right, isn't it? And he said, no, he said, we're taking him to Whitemore. At Whitemore, he'd come out of his cell and he just knocked out about seven prison officers. So he was on a charge for that. And he said, he's refusing to go. He said, it's going to be a fucking nightmare. He said, uh, we're going to have to fight him onto the van. We've asked if we can do a video link. The judges have turned it down. He said, so, he said, we're going to have to fucking fight him on the van. I said, well, I'd get on all right with him, actually. I'll have a word with him. So he said, uh, all right, yeah, go and have a word with him. So I goes, and the asshole said, well, my dad said, I'm going to have a word with danger. So he said, all right. And so I went to his door, not opened the door, but I'd just opened the flap on the door. I said, danger. He went, all right, Phil, what's up? I said, I'm, I'm one of the escort, mate. We've got to take you to Whitemore. I said, and I've just been told that you're not going to go. He said, Phil, he said, don't get me twisted. He said, I know when I get to fucking Whitemore, they're going to be jumping all over me, except for what I did. I said, well, I'll tell you what, danger. I don't want to fight you onto a van. That's what we're going to have to do if, we, if you say you're not going. I don't want to do that. We get on. I said, I'm telling you now that I'll make sure nothing happens to you while you're in those holding cells down there or anything. I'm telling you now, nothing will happen. And he said, I'll come. So I said, OK. So I went back to Neil Barnes. I said, he's coming. He went, what? I said, he's coming. So I just had a way. I got on all right with him. I said, but I'll tell you what, nothing's happening to him at all. I said, I, I get what he's done, but he's there to be judged on that. Other people ain't going to get retribution for it. If they want to give him five years, ten years, whatever they want to do, so be it. But nobody's going to be jumping all over his head when we're there or anything. So he said, well, I, and he said, well, I'm not going to do it. I said, I know you're not. I said, but I've just given my word, so I'm making sure it won't happen. I said, because if, if anything like that happened, you'll never get him there again. So anyway, we did the escort, got there, and I'm cuffed to danger. And we're looking at the video evidence, and I'm watching it, and he's talking to me, danger. And he said, just watch here, Phil, now. And he said, watch on the, on the landing. And there's on the landing, you can clearly see an officer, an SLO with the, the spot and the stripe, like this, at danger, giving it to him. So he said, this went on for about a week, giving it to me at the door, having a go, and I, I warned him, warned him, and said what was going to happen. And he said, eventually, he came to my door that day, he said, that's what happened. The aftermath of it was horrendous. But I listened to you, your interview with Alan Lord. Yeah, Alan. And significantly, I picked up on one thing with Alan, and I met Alan a few times. I wouldn't say we had a close relationship, because nobody did. And I know he said he didn't get much gym at Long Line, which is probably why I didn't see him. But he said it was down to the PEIs. Well, I don't remember ever stopping him from coming to the gym. I would never have stopped anybody. I'm not saying he, he, was, he wasn't stopped. But... Alan Lord, I remember the one where he said he, his first day in um, Strange Ways, and he was going in the cell and he got a clump on the back of the head and said, get in there, you black murdering bastard. Hmm. Well, that can form the rest of your days, which probably did for Alan as well. 
So they're coming out and fighting every time. Makes them anti authority. Did you see a lot of bullies with the prison officers kind of yeah, like you, with the racist comments or battering people just for the sake I, of it? I didn't really see racist comments, if I'm honest. But since leaving the service, I no doubt know that racism exists just from little things that I see or hear. And it surprises me, really. But why I put it, and I questioned a friend of mine as well, who's now retired, who was a bit like me, treat people fairly, get respect back. He was a little bit like me. I said to him, I said, I look back now, I never saw any racism off officers, but now I see certain comments on social media, and I think, that's racist. And, uh, and it surprises me, and he said, I see the same. He said, but I think what it is, birds of a feather flock together. He said, and he said they would have that conversation with like-minded people, but because they know you or I would pick them up on it or say something and say, what the fuck are you saying? He said that they wouldn't ever speak like that in front of you. So he said, so I, I would never say racism never existed because I know it did. What about the Mufti mob? The Mufti mob? Oh, well, I've been Mufti mob. Because I've had people on that say they're ruthless. People say they, they kill people, but they've got the right gears on. They've got the the, the, the balaclavas, man. I'm, and the, the, what, is, what is actually the Mufti's job? The Mufti job is CNR, but they're specialist trained. So you go away on a specialist course. So if they've got a problem like an incident at height or an ostrich situation, the Mufti, as they call it, but the CNR, they will be called in a specialist team with specialist equipment to try and talk them out or fight or go in. Like the the Mufti squad that came in when Alan Lord was Strange on, way, right? on the on the roof. I know the Mufti squad then, they tried to go in on the the second day and they were stopped from going in. Uh if they had it done, I think it would have been stopped earlier. As soon as they got there, they would have gone in. But it was stopped and obviously it escalated too far then. They couldn't actually get to them or anything. But the Mufti squad really is there for when things have gone beyond when there's a prison riot, like the one they had at Long Light in one of, just before I was finishing there. They had three riots in the space of 18 months. What happens when there's a riot in prison? It, everything else gets locked down. So say a wing gets up and there's a riot, everywhere else is locked down. For instance, one, the, one of the riots, we had a gym class on in the night and we get heard over the radio, all available staff. As soon as you know all available staff, report to the wing, you know there's a problem. Anyway, it's gone off completely. Massive riot there. The staff had to withdraw. As soon as the staff withdraw, really, like that, then the Mufti, the CNR teams from all over the other prisons would come and then start making a plan of action to go in and take the prison back. How much staff are on a prison? You would have, because obviously you've not just got prison staff, you've got probation staff, mm -hmm. but just officers and uniform staff, you would have about, again, five, six hundred staff. What about celebrities? Any of us come across any celebrities in yeah, prison? Yeah, quite a few. Ronnie O'Sullivan's dad. So I know you say he's not a celebrity, but it yeah. was pretty much just because of his... He's friends with John Massey, big yeah. guy Blink yeah. from uh, Glasgow as well, good, like they were all in. Good character, you know, yeah. Ronnie How was Ronnie O'Sullivan's dad? Yeah. Great character, great character. He's, and he's a good sportsman as well, you know. For his age, he was getting quite old at the time when I met him. But he still played football, tennis, a good tennis player. Not many people beat him at tennis. Mm. But very quick witted. If you said something, he'd be straight back with a line. Like, how was it like when he's seen his son and stuff, like winning trophies and being the greatest snooker player of all time? Well, at, at Long Latin, the a colleague of mine, Martin Beale, he actually arranged and his son and uh, Stephen Hendry and that came into the, the prison gym with all the snooker tables put in there. And we had a, a full day event with all the, the uh, Jimmy White came in. He's a legend. Yeah, Jimmy White came in. So that's got a lot of celebrities come in the prison in the times. Who well. else? We've uh, just visiting this one, like, we had, um, 
football, a few footballers come in. Dion Dublin. Um, what other slaves were in prison? In my time, I didn't really have many real celebrities. I know a lot of celebs went, but because I was in a cat here, most of the celebrities wouldn't really land in a cat here. Yeah, they had that sort of prison. Yeah, stupid kind of I mean, you had lot of, quite a lot of the footballers and stuff, and, mm -hmm. and I know some of them became Jim Aldley's from the PE staff that, that I know spoke about them becoming uh, Jim Aldley's and that. How did you stick the job so long, Phil? That's yeah. a long time, man. I loved it. I loved that. What did you love about it? The characters, the... Every day was different. I'd go to work. And I can honestly say, nearly 30 years, never once woke up out of bed and thought, I don't want to go to work. It was only because I got cancer that, that stopped my career, really. And even when I got diagnosed with cancer, my one goal, every time I saw my consultant was, when do you think I'll be able to get back to work? For fuck's sake, the big C didn't even stop you. Like, no, I still did, went back for five years after the big C. How does a man who doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, trained all his life, eats well, get then, is it cancer on the throat? Yeah, like, yeah. Did you question that? Like, why? Yeah, yeah. Or is it yeah, a hereditary thing from family? Like, what, I did. What was that? There's, um, there's two different forms of throat cancer as well. Okay. And one of them's a HPV. What's that mean? The human papilloma virus. Okay. And it's quite pre prevalent in young girls. Uh, they now vaccinate young girls up to the age of 14 against it because it's quite prevalent. When women get cervical cancer, it's normally due to HPV. So I, I had a bit of a... My, my weakness, my Achilles heel if you like, was women. Uh, for a ginger kid, I, didn't, I did all right. With <laughs> for a ginger kid growing up, I did all right with on the on the ladies' front. And the HPV virus can be a form of, obviously, having intercourse with, with a woman. Obviously, going down on a woman. Too much pussy? Yeah. What a fucking way to go there, isn't I know. it? I know. I just hope it was one of the good ones I got. <laughs> I better out. get fucking tasted then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? When I was told, when somebody told me, it's too much pussy, licking pussy that's give you that, I said, fuck off. Didn't believe it. But one of the film stars got it. And I was reading about him and he's saying, it's PV virus. He split up with his wife over it because he was saying, well, now I haven't got HPV or... They, they split up over it. Good so my man. mate said to me, he said, that'll be HPV virus, you know. So I looked into it, and when I went to my consultant, don't even know me, my wife knows the full extent of this, but when I saw my consultant, I said, is the cancer HPV? And he confirmed that it was. That's mad. So, uh, so you got cancer through... Be careful. Yeah, I'm okay now, but... Yeah, I'm mean, I'm mean, I'm well, I wish I'd known that. Fuck's sake, man. But Any time you're, you're scared to get an STD, fuck's sake, then yeah, all, all of a sudden, man, you should be worrying about the big C. All, all my friends, my, my nickname going through the service for years was Lick em Old Curry. And so, I, obviously, after I got... I beat the cancer, and they always said, oh, Lick em Old Curry, you know, you got it in the end. Is that just... That downfall. Is that with sex or just muffin? No. Muffin. So I, so I said, uh, yeah, I'm Lickham Old Curry PC before cancer. So ever since, never did it again. But it still returned 10 years later and here I am. I've never heard of that. Yeah, it's true. So that, that's a I. true story? Honestly, true. That's madness. Yeah, so that's what, you, that's what you think the connection with your throat cancer is as well? Yeah, licking pussy? 100%. 100%. Get everybody in washing their mouths now and brushing know, their teeth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah the debts all on the tongue. Yeah, all these poor <laughs> bastards lying in the cancer ward and their missus are giving them divorces now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say there's two forms of it, so get checked first which one it is. That's mad. But yeah, I, I was, oh, dead. and I'm, I'm not proud to say it now because I'm happily married. My wife's a lovely, lovely girl. And to be honest, I've treated her. I'm lucky we split up for two years because of it, because of the way I was. 
I was like, coming back late, tree, didn't tree around, and to be honest, I met her. One of my first days at Long Line, I met my wife, walked past the office, did a sec second take, just thought she was really nice. We got together, uh, on and off, over time, but it was always me that ruined it by going off, doing my own thing, seeing other, other women. Do you see yourself in your dad then? Yeah, yeah. Hundred percent. I said that to her when um, when we split up for the two years. We got a little boy, Henry, and I remember saying to her, "You know what? I ruined it. Here I am." And I remember my dad. You know, he went back to my mum uh, about a year after splitting up, and he was with another woman. But he went back there and said, "Look, would you give me another chance?" And my mum was no chance. My mum's a hard woman that way, she won't forgive anything. Mm -hmm. And he said, no way. And she's still friendly with him, gone, gone really well. But she said, no chance. And then with that, so obviously I've, I've messed up my relationship with her. And to be honest, I knew then she was my love of my life. But I was just trapped in this downward spiral of always ruining everything. What do you think and that was? I think part of it was the... And this was what Phil Curry had become, or the watch Phil, now he'll go and get it. So it was all part right. of a show, an act. We'd go in a club or a pub, to be a group of women. I'd be the one who'd go over and put the act on, get talking, and then introduce friends to them. It's all a bit of a show, really. And it wasn't, and I'd end up going off with one of them. And that's not bravado. I look back now and I just think, I had a brilliant wife, and at the time I thought I'd ruined this. I got a little son, and, and I thought, now I'm going to live my dad's life. I went back to Sarah, same as my dad did with my mum. This was about a year later, saying, look, I was with another woman then. Uh, she was wanting to get engaged, wanting to get married, and I said to her, look, she wants to get married, engaged. I said, I still love you, I want to be with you. And she looked and said, I can't, Phil. She said, all my friends, you know, they all say, I told you so, and said, I, ca I can't. She said, you know, well, what are they going to say? If I took you back again. I said, yeah, so I had to swallow it. I got engaged, was planning on getting married. Didn't want to do it. I kept virtually on a weekly basis, even though I was there. I would always say to Sarah and my wife, I would say, look, is there any chance? And this one day I got a phone call off her, bearing in mind I'm living with this other woman now. Got a phone call off her and said, um, Phil, it's Sarah. I said, you know, is it too late? Can we give it a go? So with that, I just walked out of the front door, went back to her and said, do you mean it? She said, yeah, if, you know, if you can. I said, well, if I come back, I'm telling you now, I'll give you my word, I will never, ever let anybody be able to throw it back at you saying, we told you so, never. Do you think that charming attitude then with the women has helped you as a prison officer, with the men, not in a gay way, yeah, but yeah. just the kind of the manipulation side of things? Yeah, definitely. Being able to talk to somebody and get them round in a different way Sweet rather them than up. fight them. Yeah, yeah. yeah under, 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 no doubt about that. So you got the big C then and then you wanted to go straight back to work, but then you ended up in, what was the prison when you came back? I went back to Long Line. I was off uh, with cancer for... Just over a year of treatment, I had chemo, radio, 35 sessions. What's the percentage of survive? They give me a 30% percent chance How does that then change your whole outlook on life? Because my old man passed with leukemia and I just watched him deteriorate. It yeah. doesn't affect me as much now, but at the time it affected me because it's you always think the people around you, the people you love will never go. I know. And then you see them go in such a, a way where you never ever forget it, but... It's just sad to see. Like, what are you thinking when you're in, like, getting treatment and chemo? And obviously, you fucking bald anyway before yeah, it, so you wouldn't have to worried about shaving well, your hair. Well, funny enough, when I saw the consultant, he said that about the treatment, the chemo, and the radio, and not a lot of people know that there's loads of different types of chemo mm -hmm. that you can have. It's not just one. Yeah. One fits all. So he said that you'll be pleased to know that the, the chemotherapy that will put you on, you won't lose your hair. I said, well, that's one side effect. I wouldn't mind. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't bother me. So anyway, it was harsh. But I remember seeing my dad towards the end of his life. 
And we became estranged because my sister, her kids, we lived on the Isle of Wight at the time with my kids. And um, if he had a fallout really with my daughter and he never bought the, her kids any presents for Christmas and birthdays, but he still did mine. So I remember ringing him up and I said, look, me and my sister are very close anyway. I said, look, if you're going to buy one, don't, you know, don't buy mine. Don't, you're not going to buy her kids' presents. Don't buy mine. I said, because it's not for her. It causes problems for me and her. I said, I'd rather you didn't bother. And from that day for probably about 15, 20 years, I never saw or heard of him. Do you regret that? I do a bit. I do a bit, but I also don't regret making my decision about that neither because I, did, I didn't feel right. You're stuck in the middle. Yeah. Either way, you're going to lose somebody. Yeah. Yeah, but the next time I saw my dad or spoke to him was a few weeks before he died. Got a phone call at Long Martin saying your dad's not got long. I went up to see him with my sister and my brother. But it was like, almost like seeing a stranger, really. How does that affect you? It was hard. Went to the funeral and uh, all his side, all the, the lady he married, all the grandchildren that side were mentioned, but no mention of ours and it was like sitting there watching somebody else's funeral but sad but absurd really we, we all said after well that was strange it didn't seem like our dad sad that and families divide but <clears throat> listen just some families are pains in asses whether it's your mum dad brother yeah. sister like, yeah. you don't need to be with them if they're not making you feel good but no. I just think when people f have those fallouts over pity shit it's, yeah. um, it's sad because when you're lying in your deathbed, when you think you've got a 30% chance of living, all you want is your family and the people yeah. that you love around you. And yeah. That tells you that, wait a minute, I shouldn't have been stubborn. Yeah. And that's all it comes down to, stubbornness. Yeah. Nobody want to make the first move. Or, and life goes that fast. Like you, 30 years in the prison system, they'll just flew by. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that's the, the mad thing about life is we never know when the big man up the stairs is, is ready for you. And, no. And that's it. You would never have thought you'd have had the big C, like fit, strong, never drank, never smoked, bang. No. So see when you got the all clear, so you just want to get straight back to work? Yeah, I, got, I had the sessions and the radiotherapy, two weeks after you finish the radiotherapy, mm. it still builds up in the system. So that two weeks, you're probably at your worst, really. And that's a real slow recovery back. I mean, the first three weeks of chemotherapy and radio, I trained. I went to the gym every morning for the first three weeks but anyway i got i got goes back and they said oh you're all clear they say all clear but you're not all clear until five years really officially so there's no sign of cancer the clusters in remission i suppose so my goal then was i said look as soon as i can I get back to work i was still in my bed most of the day if i walked from from me to you i was out of breath from being so fit and people, my wife was saying, I don't think you'll get back. I said, I've got to get back. So I've got to get back to work. That's, you know, that's what I do. And I just strive for that normality. And every day I couldn't eat. I was fed through a pipe up my nose for a little while, couldn't eat. Eventually I started being able to have a little bit of yogurt, some protein drinks, get just forcing them down. Started to, try and do a little bit further every day walking but all the time my goal was to get back to work uh the the the, the governor at the time at the prison was uh, a governor called mr cartwright and he was for want of a better word a c-u-n-t a, a, a horrible blow everybody hated him all the staff all the prisoners so times had changed in the prison that and he was one of these that would just dismiss you like that if he could. No, it didn't matter that I had cancer, really. If he, if he could get rid of me and stop me being on his, on his sick record, on his numbers, he would do it. So anyway, on my first meeting with him, I went into the prison, sat down like me and you, had a POA representative with me, and he said, I need you back at work. And I said, well, I need to be back at work, so we're singing from the same hymn sheet. I said, but at the minute, I, I said, I can't. I said, I'm telling you now, as soon as I, I can be back at work, I'll be here. I said, because I don't want to be at home. I, I, 
I'm hating it. I want to be no back normal. So he said, well, you've had so long off now. He said, um, he said, we're going to have to look at medical inefficiency, which would mean I'd finish the job. I said, no, no. I said, I don't, I don't want that. I said, I'll tell you what, I've been off now for nearly six months. I've not, obviously not had any leave this year. I said, I'm prepared to take my leave and be off sick. So officially I'll come off the sick record. I'm still sick, but I'll take my leave. And he went, really? I said, well, if that's the, op if that's the only option, I'll do it. And he got a piece of paper in the, that form. And he said, look, sign there to say that you're, you're volunteering to do this. So I signed the piece of paper, the peer web law said, you shouldn't have to do this. I said, I don't care. I said, I said, to be honest, I don't want to go back down to the gym anyway and then turn up and say, well, I've got all this lead to take now. They've just all been covering for me, been brilliant with me throughout. Ra the prisoners and the staff raised nearly £20,000 for um, a piece of state-of-the-art equipment for Birmingham Hospital. I said, I've had that much support off people. I'm not going to go in the gym and say, right, I've, I've been off all this time, but... I've got this leave to make up and then be off again. So I said, so I sod the leave, I'm not, I don't want it anyway. I want, when I get back to work, I want to be at work, I don't want the leave. So he, he was a bit flabbergasted by it. So anyway, I went off, went off on leave, took all my leave. By the end of that, fortunately, I thought I'm well enough to at least do. And he said, I don't, to be fair to him then, and I think because of what I did, he said to me, Phil, all I need from you just come in for an hour a day at first and just do whatever you can. So they had me doing this filing cabinet and doing filing papers and I thought, oh, this is shit. So I went to him, I said, look, I've done a couple of days of filing, I want to be in the gym. He said, well, he said, I don't know whether you're well enough to be around prisoners or... I said, look, I've not got a problem being around prisoners. I said, I said, prisoners have supported me all the way through it. I said, I've had cards off prisoners sent to home. I've had cards off prisoners that have been moved on to other prisons that have sent to me home. I had about 15 cards off prisoners. I said, I ain't got a problem going there. I said, I'll work around the back. I can do bits of work on the PE course, paperwork. I don't have to be on, on the gym floor. So anyway, they put it to the PE staff and they obviously said, yeah, no, I'll have him over here. So then the week after I was back over in the prison, started to go into the gym and do a little bit, meet prisoners again that I hadn't seen for, for ages, for years, gym orderlies. And then the sting in the tail came not long after that, to be honest. I'd been back, started building myself up, started to get a physique again. And then I went, because the radiotherapy can cause um, bone damage, so where I'd had it, it caused bone damage all around my jaw and my teeth had all started to break away. I'd be eating something or, and I'd just get bits of teeth in my... So anyway, I went to the dental hospital in Birmingham and they said, we thought it might happen because of how much you had. They said, but we're going to have to take all your teeth out. I'm like, fuck, you know. I'm telling well, there was one way that would stop me from licking pussy this was going to be it because nobody was looking at me then so anyway so a day it was and they said to me do you want them all out do you want the top rack out and then the lower rack the week after or do you just want them all out in one so I just do it all in one so they said they had a look and they said look you have to go to Plymouth for hyperbaric oxygen therapy so you like go in a diving chamber so I went there for six weeks to strengthen my jaw or to help try and do that. I did that. Still went to the gym every day while I was down there doing the hyperbaric every morning. Became good friends with the, the people in the gym there. Started taking a few sessions. So I was almost effectively a PEI down there taking people on, on classes and that. So it was great. So I did the hyperbaric. Came back, they took all my teeth out. Went home. Just completely, loads of blood coming out. Saw my son who just broke down in tears. He didn't recognise me. And then um, obviously the governor's saying, well, what are you doing about coming back to work? So I said, well, once it's healed, I'll come back. 
I had to do eight months without any teeth. So I went back into work. I saw a few of the staff, and a few staff who knew me well just walked straight past me. I mean, even now my jaw is sagged a little bit. Don't look anything like I used to facially. But I've walked past people and they've walked straight past me, you know. Even people who knew me well. And one of the, I remember one of the women there, the female officer, she came to me and she said, Phil, you can't come to work like this. I said, you're going to be working with prisoners, you can't work like this. I said, why? I said, why? I'm going to choice anyway. I said, I don't want to leave the job. I said, I still want to do the job. And so I went down the gym. And I always remember our gym orderly, Dave Smith. Good lad, Dave. He'd, um, again, in, in for murder. But Dave was well connected in the prison as well. He'd done a PE course, got through the PE course. And I set up a mentoring course as well. So they'd do the PE course, then we'd have him as a mentor on courses for other people. So Dave was one of those who'd been a mentor. So he, he's a mentor. I go down, see Dave for the first time, no teeth. Bearing in mind, the last time I saw Dave was before going for treatment. And he shook my hands and said, Phil, I just wish you all the best. You're a brilliant lad. Uh, all the orders were there, some of them in tears. So off I went, did my treatment, come back, no teeth now. And Dave just come to me and said, Phil, he said, I respect you. He said, you know that. He said, not a single prisoner in this prison will have a bad word to say about you. He said, that was before. He said, but if they do, if anyone says anything, come and see me. And I never had anything. Mm -hmm. In all the time, nothing. Did they, it came back, but did it not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you think you've got yourself big and strong again. You've got a new set of ashes. You're feeling good. You're back working. And yeah. How did, how did it come back? One of my things when I got back into the prison, one of my things was I said, right, when I, I did a bit of cycling as well as the weight training. Yeah, because you cycled in France for charity, is that uh, right? Yeah, I went up Mont Blanc two, three times, three times in a day. How long did that take you? Um, Probably about six hours. What's the distance? Uh, it's 1,190 odd metres, I think it is. All uphill though? All uphill. Yeah. I mean, it takes you 20 minutes to descend it. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the three routes up it. Mm -hmm. And it weren't just me. I mean, if I was doing it on my own, I'd do it quicker. I did it with, um, there's an app called Be Cool on your bike that you can do in the shed. So you can practice it on a turbo. And I did it in there in an hour and 20. So I've, I've got myself as fit as I'd ever been in my life. After the big sea? Yeah, I did a warm up a warm-up ride the year before, which was the Tour of Yorkshire, you know, when the Tour of France yeah. came to England and it started in Yorkshire, so I did that exact same route with a group again for charity. And uh, I overheard one of my friends, Munch, and Munch did all the organ, because I, when I first went into hospital and they said they got cancer, I picked up a pamphlet, a bit like I did all them years ago when I joined the job, and I saw this cyber knife thing well, they're trying to raise money. So I said to him, look, get the lads rallied round. And he did that, all the prisoners and staff, and raised £20,000 for that. And we were there for the opening event when it was open and everything, which was great. So anyway, I did this this event, but I overheard Munt saying to somebody, and some other people were telling me, oh, you keep saying about how they'll hold back for you and make sure they complete it with you. So I'm thinking, fuck that. I said, ah. Oh. They ain't gonna be waiting for me. So and I'm, I, I, I hammered the bike. I was on it all the time at home. Ten o'clock at night, I'd be hammering it on the bike. Fit as, again, as fit as I've ever been in my life. Do you think that's what's kept you alive, though? No doubt about it. I mean, I've no saliva. That's why I carry a bottle, and I struggle with my voice a little bit because the radiotherapy got rid of all my saliva glands. How much weight have you lost? I lost six. Uh, Seven stone at the, the, the point of my lowest, from 16 stone to nine. So seeing you're in I'm now 13. So seeing you're in recovery, but for your height as well, you should be what, about 15? Yeah, yeah. So f when, you, when it comes back, what are you thinking? Like? It came back and all. It was just by chance, James, you know. I was, just, 
I was walking my dog, which I got when I retired, which is another story about the retirement. What sort of dog? A Labradoodle. Yeah. A big one, though. A big, mm-hmm. yeah, a big lad. I've got a lot of wheeler, mate. He's have a you? fucking nutcase. So I got him. I always said, whenever I leave the job, I'll get a dog. I wouldn't have one before because I wanted to go walking. Mm-hmm. So I walked all over him, up hills, mountains, everything, all over. So do the walking, still going to the gym. But I'm starting to get a bit of a pain in my back, up my back when I'm walking. And I said to my missus about it, and I get like a flutter around in my heart. So I'm thinking I've probably got a bit of a heart problem. I'm thinking, how's that? I could have been No, I'm fit as anything. So she said, why don't you just go to the hospital and get it checked or ring the doctor? So I rung the doctor, the, and 111 is it, and rung them. And I'm on the phone and uh, described what it was. And they said, right, stay where you are. We've got an ambulance coming out to you. I'm like, I said, no, I said, I don't need an ambulance. I said, you know, it's not, it's not like I don't feel like I'm having a heart attack or anything. So I kind of went through and said, no, no, we've got to get something to you. Ambulance came out and I was blue lighted to the hospital. And when I saw the doctor, he'd done some tests and he said, we think you're having an aorta aneurysm. Well, funny enough, a, a real good friend of mine had had an aorta aneurysm not long ago, PDI. He had it, actually had it at work. So I knew what that was and I knew that's 1% chance of living if it's that so I'm thinking so I'm quickly on the phone to my missus and said look this doesn't sound good I said um, they're talking about me having to have a blood transfusion and a and a heart transplant and do the valves and, and she's going what I said no so anyway the, he did some more checks <laughs> went for a scan he came back and he said to me he said um well, it's not what we first thought. We thought it was an aneurysm, an aorta aneurysm. He said, but we found shadows on your lung. And I went, on my lung, yeah, all right. And he said, but you know with your history that that's not good. So anyway, with more tests, they did test after test, did uh, biopsies, trying to get um, samples of the cells off the lung, but didn't manage to get enough. Uh, but eventually, about six months later, they diagnosed that I had the cancer had come back. They seem to think that a rogue cell at the time when I had the treatment might have escaped and moved around the body, manifested in the lungs. It had spread to a, a part of my rib and on my pancreas. So I said, well, what does this mean? He said, it's stage four and incurable. I was like, okay, so it's not good. So he said about having chemo and radio, and I said, what what will they do for me, the chemo and radio? I know last time you were saying I had 30% chance with it of getting rid of it. So it's a no-brainer, I'm, I'm going to go for it. But this time, what does it mean? And he said, it might give you an extra three months. I said, what, three months? But that three months might be in my bed, you know, being poorly being sick. So I turned down the chemo and radio and decided to do my own thing. And I don't know whether you know James or any of your viewers know, and the best tip I could give them. One research and everything, cancer doesn't survive very well in a in an alkaline body. It likes an acidic body to to survive and spread. And I've trained all my life really hard, probably six days a week. And I don't just mean going through the motions, I mean really high-end training. So with that, what it does, it oxygenates the body and alkalines the body. Now, in my mind, what I really believe is, because of that and because of what I was doing, the cancer has been there all that time, but it's just moved so slowly. Every time I've been back to my specialist, they go down my throat with a, a wire and a camera and have a look around my neck. Obviously, there was nothing there, but because that cell had escaped and gone down to my lung, it was obviously there, but they never scanned me. They did have scanned me around that time. They might have soon found something initially. <clears throat> but because I kept myself so fit, and I think that is why, and now every time I go back, all I'll say is, he'll say, how are you doing? 
I say I'm doing well. I said I'm still going to the gym five days a week. And he'll scratch his head and he'll look at the scan. And he says, well, he said, I'll look at the scan, Phil, and to be honest, you wouldn't think you'd be able to do that. You shouldn't be where you are, really. And now I'm like two and a half years down the line with stage four, still going back, three months scans. And every time I go back, how are you doing? Still going to the gym five days. I might get a little pain in my back. But other than that, I still walk the dog 10 mile a day, get to the gym. And he says, you're a bit of an anomaly, really. He said, we, you know, we've not had another Phil Curry before. He said, we don't really know where we're at with it. That's the thing with doctors, isn't it? Sometimes you don't have to always take what they say as gospel. No. because And like, everybody's got it in their body anyway. Yeah. And some, they say some people actually have it, but then it goes it away goes. itself. Yeah. And you don't even know you've had it. Yeah, your body fights it away. Who do you think triggers it? Obviously, he says about the stuff at the start, but what's your main ingredient? What do you think with your research and that, what triggers the big C? The big C, it can be various reasons, but stress is definitely one of them, a big factor. Food? Yeah, definitely. Did you drink a lot of protein shakes? Yeah. Did you yeah. ever look into the side of dairy? Low, side low of sugar ones, dairy, dairy definitely a big part of it. Mm -hmm. I've quite all dairy. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, uh your meats, your processed meats and processed foods, all part of it. There's definitely a big minefield out there. I don't know if you've ever heard of Joe Tippins. Yeah. Well, I started following the Joe, Pin Joe Tippins protocol. So I started having the dog worming powders and I have those and started building myself up on them. What about cannabis oil? I have cannabis oil. Um, the doctors don't want to hear this stuff, though. No, no. Because they're following protocol, they're going by the book, and that's understandable. They've the, studied for years and years, but they're only following what their own orders. They're not telling you to go out in nature, do cold water therapy, exercise. I do cold water therapy. Cannabis oil. Well, all the natural things in life. I do the Wim Hof Yeah, breathing. I'm friends with Wim Hof. do Wim Hof breathing every day, cold showers. Mm -hmm. And it's still keeping you alive. You only had three months to go, so there's clearly something in it. Yeah, and there's no doubt about it. And the money uh, that's involved with chemotherapy is trillions a year. Like it's a money organisation as well. It, like I'm not a scientist or a doctor, but I've spoke to enough people to realise, hmm, something's not right. I'm not a scientist or a doctor, but I know, where I, I know where I am now. And mm -hmm. I've got a friend of mine as well, a neighbour, and I told her about it. And there were six of them diagnosed with breast cancer. Five of them had the chemo radiotherapy. All five have gone. The lady who, uh, who I befriended and talked about this, trying to do the breathing, the cold therapy, everything that I know, everything that I'd, I'd researched, she's still here four years on. And I, I saw her gardening the other day. She was still gardening. All of her friends have gone. Whenever I see it, she said, all my friends have gone. She doesn't even see the doctor anymore. They just struck her off. Yeah, that's unbelievable. So what was it feeling for you when you had to leave work? retire the the leaving was the hardest thing ever and it was the way i left we had another governor come in um oh god is that all right to mention it of course you can't mention anybody you want uh, we had another governor come in called claire pearson we'd already heard on the grapevine that she was a nasty piece of work uh, but i am i always think i'll take people as i find them I've heard people say to me that they think prisoners are a nasty piece of work and they become a real good friend. So I take people as I find them, judge people how I see them, how they present themselves to me. Sometimes you treat them with a bit of respect and you'll get that back. Or most of the time, to be honest. Anyway, Chloe Pearson started. Uh, we'd had Cartwright that I mentioned before that wasn't a very good governor. And the description that we got on the grapevine before she came that this is car right in the skirt. And that's what I was said about her, about her. Anyway, she came. She came down the gym one of the first days. I'd just had a PE course finish. So we had some of the lads in there. I brought some, which was just what we did those days. I, I brought cheese and biscuits and different stuff because I'd asked the kitchen to do a buffet. And generally, it was just crap, really. So I'd, I'd bring out my own pocket, I'd bring some cheese and biscuits, bits and stuff in to put a decent spread on, because they've worked hard all year for it. 
So anyway, we've done that and we've got cheese and biscuits in the other room after we've done all the presentations. I always try and ask the governor to come down to present the certificates. So I thought, ideal opportunity, new governor, try and impress her, make, make her realise how good the gym is and the work that we do. She came down, didn't really show a lot of interest. The prisoner was saying, well, she didn't really interested. She went away after giving the certificates out. And as she was going, I said, Governor, just to let you know, I've brought cheese and biscuits in for the prisoners. Uh, is that OK? And she said, well, you do know that's trafficking. So I said, OK, I won't give them. So we didn't have it anyway. So I explained to her, we've got a new governor. I've got to follow what, what she said. So anyway, we did it. And the prisoners were fine about it. They were, they were bothered. Didn't like her for it because the initial reaction that, again, initial response. She could have said just this once then, but you know, it won't happen again. Mm -hmm. Fine, okay. So that, that, that make it easier to make a decision to leave? Well, that, that was just, that was a, yeah, it did make my decision easier in the end, but that wasn't the reason why I left. We had, the, as I mentioned, we had the three riots in the space of 18 months, real bad riots. Before the build-up to that riot, we got no end of problems on the wing. We got prisoners coming down the gym who I got on with. And there was one lad again from Birmingham, part of the, the Johnson and Burgers, you know, the, the divide between them. And there was another lad who was part of their gang. So there's two different gangs on the landings on one of the wings. They, they seem to be getting all right. There's no problems. Well, there's one of them that's just a nightmare, wherever he goes. China Walters, he's called. Getting all right with him in the gym, but it's just a night on there. Whatever wing he's on, there'll be problems. And even his own people, his own post scored. I had one lad come down the gym and he said, Phil, he said, to keep putting back on the fucking wing. He said, I've told people, what am I supposed to do? He said, I've told people, you put him back on, there's going to be murders. Because we have to try and protect him. People want to kill him. He said he'll either be killed or somebody be killed if she keeps bringing him back up. He'd gone back off to the seg, and then she'd made the decision again. It was a bit of a, almost become a bit of a project for her really to try and get him right and settled. But it was never going to happen. So she'd been back on the wing again, looking at bringing him back up. The other cons had noticed this. He come down to the gym that day and he said, Phil, he said, I tell everybody what we're supposed to. I put a security report in saying, look, if you bring him back up, there's gonna be a, there's gonna be problems. Lo and behold, she brought him back up. The wing almost went up. We went over to answer the alarm bell, I ran up, and the whole landing are going at each other, and the staff have withdrawn. So I said, We need to get back on before it goes. So we got back on, I know. The, the lad Creeper quite well, spoke to Creeper, said, Creeper, you know, get behind your doors. They all, everybody went behind the doors. It wasn't just me, I'm not a hero. There were loads of others came on then, gone behind the doors, and, the, and that was the end of that. But that was the start of it. The week or two after, there were six prisoners come out on the landing, refusing to go back in, doing a peaceful demonstration. I run up to an alarm bell, and they just sat there saying, we're not going away, we want, we want some dialogue, they're talking, they're fine. And the number one governor sat there and she said, get them behind the door, whatever means possible, just get them behind the doors. And there's, uh, they were there and they were saying, at the time they were saying, it's because of her that this prison is going up. So it's because of her down there. So if you've got no problem with any of you staff, so she's causing all the problems. So it went on again. They tried to tell them that what was going to go on because they hadn't. They, their answer to that was put six of them back down the seg. Those six who, who stayed out went down to the seg. And one by one, a few of them came back up on different wings. They had another incident, a minor incident. And then one night on the build up to this, it just kicked off completely. And it all just stemmed again. It's like, I'm a big football fan, I heard you're a Celtic yeah. fan. Celtic might be down, no, it don't happen to Celtic, I'll use my football team. I'm a Leeds fan. <laughs> so Leeds might be down the bottom end of the league, yeah. 
and they get a new manager come in, changes the way it communicates with the players, and the team starts to respond and move up the league, all because of one man changing. Just the same players, same in the prison, really. You've got the same staff. One person comes in, changes the whole dynamics. And that's what happens in the prison. And I saw it over the 30-year period, over and over again. But I never saw it to this degree when she came in. And it just completely ruined a well-performing prison where we'd got loads of dialogue, we had loads of meetings, loads of counsellation meetings with, with prisoners where we'd heard grievances, mm -hmm. where it never really manifested itself and became a problem. She did away with all that. It was just all dictatorship. With that, they lost the wing. I was in the gym that night when the wing went. We had a load of prisoners down the wing. We had Terry Adams, some of the big hitters in the gym. The wing went up. The Mufti crew came in eventually about three o'clock in the morning and uh, managed to take back control of the wing. To cut quite a long story short here, at the end of that, obviously I'm still struggling a little bit because with my saliva glands, I still struggle to sleep. And But with this going on, I've seen loads of staff just broken from the way she treated them. She dismissed staff at the drop of a hat. When they got the job back at head office, she just said, well, they can have the job back, but they're not coming working in my prison so they'd have to go and work somewhere else. It's just a nightmare. So anyway, the prison goes off. At the end of this, when they get the get back, this happened a few times, but Richard Vince at the time, I don't know if he still is, but he was the director general. He arranged to come in and have a, a meeting with staff, selected staff, to discuss what had gone wrong in the prison from where it was to what's going on now. So I made it known I want to be on the meeting so I saw the POA, the, the uh, POA chairman, that's a union chairman, and I saw him and I said, I'm going on a meeting. Well, he'd been pocketed a little bit by the governor. He should have been sacked, really, because of he, gross misconduct. In the seg one night where he was, there was a, a prisoner who should have been on a 15-minute watch and he'd not been to his cell door all night when he looked back on the camera. Now, anybody else should have sacked him. He kept his job. But I know for why, and everybody knew why, he kept his job, job because she got him in the pocket then. He was hers and the union had no strength. So whatever she said, he was just her puppet. Whenever anybody was dismissed, they had no union representative, nobody to support them. So all this was going on, and I, I said, I'm going to that meeting. They tried their best to stop me. I had phone calls down the prison saying, Phil, don't go to that meeting. I said, I'm going to it. I said, I'm going to tell them exactly what has gone on, what's caused it. I said, I don't care. Unbeknown to the manager, the, the governor, two weeks before that, I got a sick note. I went to the car, I knew what was, happening, what was going to happen. I knew if I went to that meeting and I put it on, that once I'd said that, if he keeps her as a governor, I'm finished. So I can't, I won't be able to go back. So I knew that, I knew I was putting it all on the table and all the staff knew it as well. I had letters off various staff saying, anonymous letters saying, will you give that to him when you go? So I said, yeah. Everyone said, you really going to go to this meeting? I said, yeah, I'm going. I thought, I've had cancer. I've had a, the only person I feared really was God and my consultant and what he might tell me. Bearing in mind, it, it hadn't come back at this point, but, I'd, you know, I'd had cancer and I'd thought that. So anyway, the meeting was getting closer and closer. I was in the classroom setting up a gym session, a classroom session, and she walked through the door, closed the door, and she goes, Phil, can I have a word? I said, yeah. So she said, um... I bet you attending this meeting and putting a vote of no confidence. I said, I haven't said about voting a vote of no, vote of no confidence. She said, with the union. I said, I'm not going to talk to no union. I said, I'm going talking to your boss. I'm going to tell him. So she goes, well, you're going to get thrown under a buzz. 
I said, oh, Kurt. I said, bring the buzz. And she was fuming. Walked out of the office and then uh, the lads were going, what was that about? So she told me not to go to a meeting, I'm going. I had a good friend who was a governor there, he used to be a PI. He called me to his office, said, sit down, Phil. He said, I know what it's about, John. And he said, I've been called up to the governor's office. I said, yeah. And he said, she, want, she said to me to use whatever influence I've got on you to stop you going to the meeting. He said, but to be honest, he said, I don't think you should go. He said, you know full well they're going to back her in the meeting. I said, oh, how do you know that? I said, we don't know that unless somebody goes and tells him. Nobody else is going to do it. I'm going to do it. He said, well, she's told me. I said, well, I'll tell you what, John. Go back to her and tell her to get fucked. I'm going to the meeting. So he just shook his head. And I went back down to the gym. Anyway, the day of the meeting was starting to come closer. One point I should bring up, actually, going back before this, that brought on a lot of the problems. We had a, a prisoner called uh, Jewel, and I'd gone really well with him. Before, he was on his way down to the gym, and I said, all right, Jewel, and he went down. He'd been on the PE course, and he came back out because there was no, not enough to play football. So he said, I don't want to do weight so I'm going back to the wing. I said, hey, Julie, I said, what's going on with you? He said, I knew he'd smashed his cell up recently and had loads of problems. I said, I was looking for you for a gym mentor's job. I said, and you're smashing your cell up and that. He said, Phil, this prison's fucked, he said. He said, just gone right down the hill. He said, uh, he said, but just to give you heads up, he said, you might want to get off early tonight. So I thought, so I went back down to the gym. I said, did Julie say anything to you? He said, nah. So I rung security up. I said, look, I, did, I don't know what it means. It might mean anything. I said, but Anthony Jewel just came down to the gym. He told me that, you know, I might be late home tonight. It could be anything. I, he said, what did he say? What it was? I said, nah. And he said, I said, I don't know what it is. He said, well, I, I got on with him well. I'll go over to the wing and have a word with him. So lo and behold, he went over to have a word with him, said, Julie. And with that, three of them went on the netting. So anyway, after that, I got an investigation sheet through a charge sheet of the governor saying you, you're going to be charged with causing an inc incident at high. So I said, well, how did I cause the incident at high? I said, all I did is report what I'd been told. I said, there was another officer stood at the door with me. I'm not going to name his name, but... He never even told anybody. But I'm being accused of causing the incident at I for reporting it. So I didn't know what was going on. I said, in the morning, another prisoner told me that there's going to be a lot of problems over the weekend. I put a report in about that because she was saying, well, why didn't you take him to the seg when he told you that? I said, not done anything. I said, besides, the seg's full. You've got it full. Where would I put him? So anyway, that was the build-up to it, because I went to see her, uh, made an appointment to see the governor, was invited in and was sat like this where me and you are. And she said, take a seat, and I took a seat. Said, she said, what's the problem, Phil? And I said, look, I've been given a charge sheet here saying I caused an incident at high. I said, I've got people coming up to me, officers, saying I won't fucking report anything again. He says, you're doing me for reporting something. So I didn't know what it was. Security went over there. They chose to go and, to go and see him, and he went on the netting. I haven't t caused him to go on the netting. So anyway, she turned and she just said, it's right and proper that you're investigated. She said, uh, and by the way, you brought more to my table today. You self-rostered in the gym, meaning we've self-rostered our own shifts. So she started threatening me about taking that away. And it went from there then, really. And then they had the riot. And then I said, I'm going to the meeting. The day the meeting came, Richard Vince comes in the prison. There's about 15 staff around the table. I go and sit down. He walks in. I've seen him a few times, gone all right with him. And I've heard that he's supposed to have been quite a good governor. So I thought I'd take my chance. So everyone was saying, good luck, Phil, you know, I can, 
you're brave doing it like I said it's not brave I said you look around you I said the, the prison's on its on the floor I said if she stays there's not going to be anything left so I went to the meeting he came in and she came in with him and I said before we start the uh, director with, her, with respect if the governor's going to sit here in the meeting you're not going to get the truth out of anybody nobody's going to speak up because she rules by fear Everybody's frightened of her. Why? Because she dismissed people at the drop of an eye. She Sacking people. Vind vindictive. Manipulative. If you crossed her, if you crossed her, then lose your job. It was finished. Mm -hmm. So what happened at the meeting? So the meeting, he said to me, he said, "Well, she's the number one governor, and anything that you're saying to me, you should be able to say in front of her." I said, "I'll say it. I ain't got a problem telling her. I ain't got a problem telling you." I said, well, you've got 15 people around here. I said, I'm the only one, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, if anybody else. I said, is anybody else prepared to speak out in front of the governor? And everybody was quiet. I said, nobody's going to say anything. They're frightened. So he said, well, she's staying for the meeting. I said, OK. So all the way through the meeting, every time I tried to say anything, he just shut me down. I said about the riots. He said about, well, it's a changing clientele that we've got. And I said, well, these six prisoners that were out, three, four of them have been here years. I've known them, I've known them for years. So it's not a change of clientele. So they, look, these prisoners have been in the system for years. I said, and you've got high-profile prisoners like Gary Nelson. I don't know if you've heard of Gary. No. Gary, notorious prisoner. Oh, I always go on well with Gary. I like, I like Gary. Up there again with one of the hardest prisoners probably ever in the system. Everybody would know of him. Talk to Yami, anybody would know him. So anyway, I gave him a, a scenario. I said, when Gary's wife came to visit, I know for a fact, she came with a short skirt on. I said, which, okay, fine. If you want to tell me she can't wear that skirt, fine. I said, but the governor was called down there, saw her in a short skirt, the governor's got a skirt on the same length. And Gary's wife rightly points out, saying, well, what about you? You've got a short skirt on. And the governor's response is, I'm the governor and I do what I want. And I said, that's exactly what she does. So she turned kids away from visits. Kids on visits with, with sandals on, making them go to Tesco's to get proper shoes. I said, what? What's, what's the problem with Sandal? I said, there's less place to hide a drug. I said, it's just all petty things just to, to get at people. What I happened? Said, I said, but not just that. I said, yeah, that's what's caused this riot. I said, you've completely lost the prison. And I said, I'm telling you now, it's because of the governor, why you've lost it. And he was adamant that it wasn't. I said, I'm telling you now. I said, you can put a different governor in here tomorrow, a proactive governor, like we've had in the past, and I named a few of them. I said, you put a governor like that in tomorrow, and this jail starts turning round immediately. And he said, no. Nah. So anyway, the, the meeting finished, I walked out, went down the gym, got my bag, got my stuff, and sent them off. And they went, Phew. said it didn't go well then. I said, nah. I said, uh, he's just backing her. So I walked out of the prison gate. I saw a few of the staff. I saw one of my colleagues there I've known for a long time. He said, oh, you're off training. I said, nah. I said, that's me. I'm done, finished. He went, what do you mean? I said, I'm not coming back. That's me. And he went, Phil, don't be harsh. He said, think about it. I said, I don't need to think about it. I'm going. I made the decision before. I'm going. So off I went, never went back. I had a two week sick note anyway. I had, she was telling the, my boss to come round to my house, threatening me, saying you better get yourself back to work. She's gonna dismiss you. I said, no, she's not. I said, I'm going for medical retirement. And then he come back round the next day and said, she told me you're not getting medical retirement, Phil. I said, it's not her decision. I said, I'll put him for medical retirement. I said, she's supposed to support me in it. I said, I've no saliva. I don't sleep. I've been coming to work with 
no sleep for years because I love the job. I said, but she's taken all that away. I'm not coming back. So the pressure kept pressuring me and pressuring me. And then she called me in for a, a sick monitoring meeting, which is supposed to be informal. And that was called too soon as well. So I said, well, I've only been off a week. And I said, this is supposed to happen after four weeks. I said, well, she knows you're not coming back, so she wants you in for this meeting. So I kept refusing to go in. I said, I'm not going in. I was called to Birmingham for uh, an independent uh, check by a uh, uh, health authority just to look into if I, I met the criteria for... Um, sick pay? Not, not sick pay, but uh, mm. sick retirement. Mm -hmm. And there's two levels of ill health retirement. You can either get class one, which you're not allowed to work again, but you get a real good pension payout and not many people get it. And there's level two, which is one below. You're allowed to work again, but only up to how much you earn now. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I told them everything that I've been through, just honest with them, told them all the side effects. They knew it all anyway. They did all the paperwork and everything. Months down the line, she kept putting pressure on saying she was gonna sack me. I said, no, nah. so I'm waiting for this. I've got a letter back months down the line saying that I've been awarded level one, tier one, uh, sick retirement. And uh, I heard that she was smashing stuff around in the office when she got the letter. And she had to invite me back in as well. And I, the only one of the regrets I have is when I was back in, my wife was saying, just be civil, Phil. You've got what you want. We've got, and I said, I haven't got what I wanted. I'd still be in the job. That's what I want. If she were that, that's what I wanted. But I had to go. So she said, well, you know, just just be all right. Just just go. So I went and she was trying, trying to be nice as pie. Saying, oh, Phil, I wish you all the best. And the prisoners really respect you. And I thought, you two-faced bitch. Mm -hmm. So I said to her, and she said, I had a grievance put in against her. I put that in right at the start. And she said, this grievance that you've got in, you know, you've got medical retirement. You should just get on now and enjoy your retirement. Forget the grievance. It's not going to do, do you any good to do it, carry on with it. I said, I'm telling you now, it's not part of this meeting, but I'm carrying on with it. I'm taking it as far as I can. And I did that. I took it all the way. I took it to the MP. In that meeting, that first sick monitoring meeting as well, she, when she was trying to get me back to work, she even turned around and looked me in the eye and she just said, you bad cancer, get on with it. And I just looked at her and I'd walked out. What a horrible bastard. And I said, the meeting's finished. I just walked out. And the POA bloke said to me, he said, well, you're not going back, are you? I said, are you kidding? I said, what for that? Then he went back in there and said, the meeting's finished, he's not coming back. And I walked out. So that goes to show, man, who you work for as well. That has a big effect on you. Like you say, football managers can take your bottom to the league at the top. But just 30 years of hard work. It's just a shame that it ended like that. Who's this book just, here's for? Just before we yeah, yeah. finish as well, there's a big important thing there. Yeah. I was called back in as well um, after she left. She went to Dovegate and got dismissed for bullying a couple of years later. So she's gone. But I got called back into the prison. They did a big charity event for me. To, to pay for an holiday and uh, the classroom where I talk about where all the magic happened where we did the courses and reformed big characters like people who had a, a six man unlock a man called Chris Agbula and he went out and worked never been back in prison so people that we really did turn around like that I got called back into the prison they did a charity event they give me a check and they walked me back through to the classroom and they got a plaque on the wall and it's now called the Phil Curry Education Suite. Mm -hmm. The proudest moment of my career. Ah, that's well overdue, brother. Well Thank play. you. Look, where's this book from, Phil? This book's from a lad called Tom Hill. Life in the Max, Tom Hill. Yeah, he wrote it after retiring. He was a prison officer. Mm -hmm. There's also a chapter at the end of it of a few different officers mm -hmm. and I wrote a chapter in myself. Mm -hmm. And I'm now currently working on my own book. 
everybody kept saying to me, Phil, you should write a book. Some of the funny stories I would not even mention about the, the characters that we had down there, like I had one lad with ice cream wafers in between his toes with his feet up on the table, saying I was doing uh, reflexology with him and all the other prisoners in the weights room laughing their heads off. Yeah. People used to say to me, oh, I've got my mate coming on induction today, Phil. He said, again, wind him up for us. Beefy Wilson, I'll just finish on this one. This was a classic example. Beefy Wilson was a big, powerful black man who'd come in uh, and having his induction. And I did his induction with him, and I said, right, Beefy, I said, we have to go in here now. I said, I'll do your dental check. He said, what? I said, I have to do your dental check because of all the cutbacks in the service. I said, we have to do a dental check on you now. So I got him in a chair, put his head back, got the fire hydrant in his mouth. Everybody's looking through the window at him. And I called my mate in and I said, Chris, can you just take the notes? He went, yeah. And he's looking at me, what, what the fuck's going on? I said, I'm just doing his dental check for him. Oh, okay then. So I'm going up a clue, so needs attention. At the end of it, he said to me, he said, hey, Gov, he said, can you get me a gold cap? So I said, yeah, I can sort that for you. I said, I can only get you one, though. He said, yeah, that's fine. So anyway, he off, went off back to the wing. He got talking to our gym all day. He said, hey, that PE screw is freaking diamond. He said, he's get me a gold cap. He went, what? He said, yeah. He said, who did your induction? He said, Phil Curry. He was pissing his side, he said, you've been fucking hard, mate. Mm -hmm. But every time I saw him ever since then, he always said, I like dentist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what about, would you like to finish up on anything, Phil? No, I just thank you for your time. And I hope I've given a different side to the service, really. I know you had Sam on giving his account. I can honestly say, I, I was lucky I wore the blue tracksuit because I, I made lots of friends on both sides of the fences. And I always go through life, always did go through life, thinking if you treat me people the way you wanted to be treated yourself, that's what you get back. Mm -hmm. And that's what I got back. I had 30 years, 29 years, pretty much apart from the, the ending. Yeah. But just pure pleasure and yeah, loved good, every minute of good it. Good on you, mate. You seem like a good guy, but for anybody that's maybe on a struggle right now, maybe it's in a a ward struggling, fighting for their life, what advice would you have for them? Keep fighting. Don't ever see, don't ever give in. I mean, I've, I've, I've been told months to live and I would never, I, I didn't even want to be told. When I went and he said, about how long you've got, I said, don't tell me. I said, you can't affect that. I said, I, no matter what you tell me, I'm not going to believe you anyway. I said, I've got all of as long as it takes, I'll just carry on. And I'm going to kick that can down the road as long as I can. And people down there should do the same. I did a bit of work for Hancock, at a neck cancer UK, where I went into the hospitals and spoke to patients who was going through the same as me. Talked to them and got them through uh, treatment. Uh, I had a problem wearing the mask through treatment. So I could help people with that and how, how I overcame that. So I would always say, don't ever, no matter where you are, Joe Tipping is a classic example. Days to live, five years later, still here living life. Yeah, it just shows you've done it. Phil, listen, for coming on today and telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank Wish you all the best for the future, mate. And listen, stay off that pussy, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Take care, Phil. <laughs>